Sasha Wilson. I'm a lawyer from a firm called Bristow's in London. Uh, we're particularly well known for IP and technology work and also data privacy work. Um, as you might imagine, a lot of our time and my time is spent at the moment uh, working with clients on their GDPR compliance programs, general data protection regulation that we'll uh, talk about. So this is a very, very broad topic. Um, I've only got about 10 minutes. Um, there are also a few other speakers after me, so I'm going to keep it relatively high level and try not to tread on anyone else's toes. Um, so the title uh, that I was given for this talk was How Media Companies Can Harness Personal Data Without Breaking the Law. And as a data protection lawyer, those last few letters make me a bit uncomfortable. Um, I would rather it said something like that. One of the things about data protection is it's very difficult to say you are definitely compliant or you will definitely break the law for various reasons. In particular, data protection is quite a principle-based um, regulatory regime. And whilst there are specific things you have to do to be compliant, other areas of it are about proportionality and risk base and uh, relatively subjective. So it's best not to think of compliance as a strictly binary concept, yes and no, but think about it more as a spectrum and you're trying to do things to improve your compliance level so that we can achieve an acceptable level of compliance. So I'm going to talk a bit now about um, personal data, um, some of the principles, the GDPR, which I'm sure many, if not all of you, are familiar with, and then some practical tips. So kicking it off, um, any consideration of data protection, data privacy, will always start, or at least should always start, with an appreciation of what is personal data, because this, all of this stuff will only apply if you are processing personal data. Now, the concept of personal data is quite a challenging one and quite a confusing one, particularly for um, US vendors, uh, if many or any of you are from the US, because it's a slightly different concept to PII, or personally identifiable information, that you may have come across. In, in Europe, it's quite a broad, quite a nebulous concept. And I've put on the slide there the definition under the current law. So that's, that's from the 1995 Data Protection Directive. Um, and the bits in red are the changes that will come into force from May next year when the GDPR comes in. So those, uh, that will be the definition under Article 4 of the GDPR. Um, you can see it's quite long and it's quite complicated. Um, I won't read it out, but the best way I think of uh, appreciating this is putting it into a graphic format. And that serves two purposes. Firstly, to demonstrate that I've just learned how to use smart charts in PowerPoint, which I'm quite excited about. And secondly, it shows you uh, the building blocks of, of the definition. So the first thing to think about is personal data is any information. It can be any type of information. The information itself is not necessarily personal data per se, it's what you do with it that will make it personal data. Whether that's a string of letters that happen to be someone's name, or numbers like 162.198 that may be used as an IP address, it's what that data is used for that will make it personal data. So that brings you on to the next bit of this uh, diagram. It's about identifying someone, whether that person is identified or identifiable. And again, that's quite a difficult concept because in Europe, we have a very broad concept of what it means to be identified. And through various cases that have happened and various guidance from the, uh, the European regulators, and now expressly set out in the GDPR, um, identification is more than just being able to point to someone in the real world and say, I know your name, I know you. It's singling someone out. So if you think about that in an online or a connected TV, TV setting, singling out could be targeted adverts, recommendations served to an individual. So it's very, very, very broad. Um, there are examples baked into that definition. So it says such as a name, but a name is only an example, and it also includes an identification number, location data, online identifiers. So if you think of that in an ad tech setting, that's incredibly broad. All of that type of cookie ID data, IP addresses and things like that, all potentially personal data. So I've kind of ruined the next slide a little bit uh, because I was going to do a bit of a test and I've already, I couldn't help myself, I've already given you some examples, but just to um, hammer this point home, email addresses, it's very easy to understand how that is personal data because an individual will have an email address, you send an email to them, clearly personal data. 
IP addresses, they were the subject of debate for quite a long time in Europe because, um, for example, people thought that you might have a shared device. So a television in a connected home is quite a good example. There are lots of shared viewing. But there was a case recently, Brea, where uh, the European Court found that an IP address can definitely be personal data. And certainly, Recital 26 of the GDPR does expressly give IP addresses as an example. Um, other things, first party profile, account, subscriber data, all of that type of stuff will almost definitely be caught uh, by the regulatory regime and constitute personal data. Third party data, to the extent you're buying, it, buying in Experian data, that type of thing, it will depend on what the data is, but it's most likely that data is being used for some sort of singling out or individuation, as the, uh, the regulators call it. Um, to the extent it's linked to a profile, all of that type of, act type of activity will almost definitely bring it within scope. And that also goes for device data. In particular, mobile devices, the regulators would take a very dim view on anyone that tries to argue that uh, any type of unique device identifier wouldn't constitute personal data. So that's what I'm going to say about personal data. Um, once you know you are processing personal data, there are various things you have to do. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm not going to go through these in too much detail, but there, this represents the GDPR overarching principles of compliance. There are many others, but in Article 5, it gives you the high-level principles. You have to be transparent with people. Don't collect more data than necessary. Uh, marketing teams are no, notorious for trying to hoover up as much data uh, on the basis that it might be useful later on. That's very challenging from a compliance perspective. You've got to make sure the data is accurate, um, don't store it for longer than necessary, and all that type of thing. Um, that's not massively different to what the uh, current law says, but what has changed a little bit is that bit on the right of the slide, accountability, and that's a new principle introduced by the GDPR and something that's quite important and quite different in the way compliance has to be administered within the organisation. Because what it means is you have an ongoing basis to demonstrate that you're doing everything right. So currently, if nothing goes wrong, if there's no data breach or, or anything like that, you're probably OK. If there was a regulatory investigation in the UK by the ICO or it might be another data protection authority, if there hasn't been any damage to people or, or there hasn't been a breach or anything like that, you're probably OK. Whereas from May next year, when the GDPR comes into force, if you don't have policies in place, if you haven't trained people, and if you can't demonstrate that you're on an ongoing basis doing things right, that in and of itself will be a breach under the GDPR. And that's great news for lawyers because it means we have lots of policies to draft, but quite a challenging um, concept for organisations in terms of how they have to run compliance. So I've already talked about uh, quite a bit about the GDPR. Um, I've summarised there some of the, the changes. I won't go through them all in detail. Um, accountability principle I've just spoken about. Um, another key change is the territorial applicability of the GDPR. Um, under the current law, broadly speaking, if you're an organisation that's established in Europe or if you use equipment, an obvious example being like a server based in Europe, then you're captured. But the GDPR goes one step further and businesses that are targeting uh, consumers in Europe or if you're building profiles, so that's basically means targeted advertising, you'd also be captured. So that, that's again very challenging and particularly challenging for ad tech where a lot of US ad tech vendors who previously thought they wouldn't be caught will now find themselves subject to a European data protection le legislation. There are other um, procedural things that you'll have to do. So things like data pre protection impact assessments, um, if there's a particularly high risk through the use of a new technology, that type of thing, you have to do a very administrative and procedural data protection impact assessment. Um, something I've put there, data processor liability, that's another key change. So under the law currently, it's pretty much only customers, so the entity which um, is responsible for data, uh, collecting and using data protection who will be responsible. Their service providers don't have direct um, liability to the extent those service providers are processing data on the customer's behalf. But that's going to change from May next year where 
um, data processors, which basically means service providers, they'll have direct liability, direct reg regulatory liability under the GDPR. And that's, a, that's quite a significant change, and that's affected commercial negotiations quite a lot, where service providers are now taking quite an interest in their customers' compliance as well as their own compliance. Um, and then the last thing, I'm conscious of time, so the last thing is, of course, a very high-profile thing, and the, um, the thing that is being uh, touted around at conferences, the incredibly high fines. Um, there are actually two tiers of fines in the GDPR. Um, everyone talks about the, the 20 million euros. For certain procedural type breaches, there's a 10 million euro or a 2% fine. But for many of the most important obligations, the fines are up to 20 million uh, euros or 4% of global turnover, which is a, whichever is higher. So very, very high. So what does all that mean in terms of practical steps? Well, there's a lot that organisations have to do. I've put... Um, some suggestions here. Um, privacy by design is something that regulators have been keen on for quite a long time, and it's actually codified in the GDPR for the first time. And it basically means thinking about privacy at the outset of any uh, project. And that could include, for example, running a, a privacy impact assessment, that type of thing, I ensuring that privacy is baked in or coded into your, your products and services. Um, the next thing there. Um, one of the changes under the GDPR is the notices that have to be given to consumers are much longer. So currently now, um, you can probably get away with quite short privacy policies. Under the GDPR, that has to be a lot longer. That's incredibly challenging in a connected TV environment, pre presenting notices to consumers. And I think some of the other speakers might, uh, might discuss that type of challenge. Um, the contractual requirements that um, customers have to have in place with service providers are very difficult. There's a lot more stuff that has to go in contracts. Um, Currently, you can pretty much get away with having a couple of clauses and then you're okay. Make sure the service provider has appropriate security, follows your instructions, that type of thing. There's about 10 different requirements now that have to go in contracts with service providers. So what we're doing with a lot of uh, clients is going through an exercise of reviewing all their service contracts and it's, uh, it's quite challenging prioritizing those. Um, Penultimate one there, data flows. This is another very procedural requirement under the GDPR where organisations have to map all of their data, all of their personal data. Um, that, as you can imagine, is very challenging given the diversity of touch points you might have across your, your organisation. And that, that's, uh, that's, again, quite challenging. And having that data flow mapped and documented would be part of your accountability. So it's the type of thing a regulator might request to see. And the very last thing, this again goes to accountability. Having policies in place, just having the bits of paper, is a requirement and something which could get you in trouble with a regulator. But then you have to go further and make sure that those policies are actually implemented in the organisation and staff are aware of them and they're being adhered to. So that's a, a very quick whistle-stop tour um, through the GDPR. Um, thanks very much. I'll, I'll hand over to the next speaker. <laughs> Before we do, any, any questions for Sasha? Yeah, one in, in the middle there. Where's the mic? Can we have the mic? Thank you. <laughs> Just tell us who you are, please, as well. Hi, it's, uh, it's very loud. Uh, Jeremy Pounder from Mindshare. Um, I just wonder what impact uh, Brexit might have on all of this. It's a, a very common question. Um, so it has a number of impacts. So the first thing is, it's very clear that the GDPR will be implemented in the UK. The timelines mean that it has to be because the GDPR applies from the 25th of May next year. So that's a given. The more interesting and challenging question is, what happens post-Brexit? Because without getting too, into too much of the nitty gritty, if you transfer data outside of Europe, there are certain requirements that have to be satisfied. And once the UK has left the European Union, it's possible that we may have to apply for an adequacy decision from the Commission to legitimise our transfers. And that might create some very interesting negotiations where we have to go and apply to have our own data protection law validated. But what it does mean is that whatever form a post-Brexit data protection law will take, it will have to be broadly similar to or identical to the GDPR if we have any hope of being able to enable and continue um, international data flows to, to happen. 
Quick question from me. You mentioned third-party data, such as use of Experian data, yeah. for example. Who's liable in that case? Is it Experian or is it your use of it? So it's probably best to talk about that in the, in the GDPR way. And the best way of thinking about it is everyone is, is, is liable. So when you have an Experian type relationship, so we would call that a controller to controller transfer. So you have a data collector, they have their own regulatory liability. When you receive data, you can also have regulatory liability. So it's very important to get assurances from data providers that the data they're providing you has been collected in a compliant manner and you can use it in the way that you intend to. Okay, interesting. Thank you, Sasha.